David Seymour is the co-director of the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. He argues that anti-Zionism is but the latest articulation of the Jewish question. Just as the Semitism of the anti-Semites was a product of their own distorted imagination, so too is the Zionism of the anti-Zionists. Uh, the title here is Anti-Zionism as an Offence Against the Intellect, his introduction. This presentation draws on my recent paper, Continuity and Discontinuity, From Anti-Semitism to Anti-Zionism and the Reconfiguration of the Jewish Question, which Leslie kindly published in the Journal of Contemporary Anti-Semitism. The first part of the paper offers a brief discussion of what I mean by anti-Zionism or rather the ideology of anti-Zionism. I then move on to an example of its effects in practice, which, as indicated by the title, can be understood, against, understood as an offence against the intellect, by which I mean a rational understanding of the world, both historical and contemporary. I discuss an example of this offence, the cliched assumption that international support for the creation of the State of Israel in the mid-40s was merely the result of Western guilt for the Shoah. By looking at this example, we can see that although anti-Zionism is a new phenomenon, or relatively new phenomenon, significantly dis discontinuous with previous anti-Jewish ideology, it is nevertheless unable to break out of the irrational framework of the Jewish question. Um, we can see that although anti-Zionism is a new phenomenon, significantly discontinuity with previous anti-Jewish anti ideology, it is nevertheless unable to break out the irrational framework of the Jewish question, as understood by Philip and Robert Fine. The Jewish question inverts reality by portraying anti-Jewish worldviews as plausible ways of describing and understanding the enduring Jewish inadequacy and malevolence that threatens the ordinary progress and happiness of the rest of mankind. So anti-Zionism's inability to escape the irrational and the hateful framework of the Jewish question also demonstrates anti-Zionism's continuity with older anti-Jewish ideology. So what is the ideology of, of anti-Semitism as I understand it? Today, anti-Zionism, like all anti-Jewish ideologies that went before it, tends to transcend uh, national and regional specificity in its increasing global homogeneity. This is ironic, of course, because that is specifically one of the characteristics that anti-Jewish ideology tends to project onto Jews. Anti-Semitism anti tended to corrode and hollowed out the old grand ism that was so influential in the 19th and 20th century nationalism, socialism, and liberalism. Where it succeeded, it refilled and reanimated the isms with its own poisonous but formidable spirit. Anti-Zionism could be on course to making itself into the key dominating and energizing force of the 21st century by attacking and perverting its characteristic isms, anti-capitalism, feminism, post-colonialism, and as Karen so um, eloquently described, intersectionality. Anti-Zionism reignites the Jewish question by using a self-drawn caricature of Israel, the most important contemporary Jewish project, as a metaphor for all evil and for all oppression. It is a way of concretely picturing the rather abstract enemy of the people that conspiracy fantasists hold responsible for everything bad in the world. If it is the case that anti-Semitism tells us nothing about real Jews, flesh and blood Jews, but has everything to do with the image of the Jews, it can, uh, the image of the Jews it conjures up, so too anti-Zionism detaches from both the idea and the actuality of Zionism and the state of Israel. In that recent paper, I drew a distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. I argued of the dialectic of continuity and discontinuity, and that anti-Zionism presents us with a novel articulation of the Jewish question. The Jewish question, of course, poses as an objective, 
or innocent academic and political pursuit that in reality is little more than an anti-emancipation of tautology. Time, of course, does not uh, permit a full discussion at this point, but the underlying premise is that rather than treating the question of the connection of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism as an either or, one that does injustice to both, I approach the matter dialectically. This approach allows us to rec recognize the novelty of anti-Semitism at the same time as recognizing anti-Semitism as one of its elements. Put in different terms and ways that will infure, uh, infuriate the other Hegel, Hegel people amongst us, anti-Zionism subsumes the anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism of the past, just as classic anti-Semitism is contained within earlier, just as classic anti-Semitism contained pre-modern forms of anti-Judaic practice and in so doing presented us with something new. This approach avoids the imposition of a simplistic binary choice between the idea of a radical separation between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and its opposite, the conception of anti-Semitism as nothing but ongoing repetition. Anti-Zionists like Badiou and Traverso feel the need to maintain their absolute innocence of anti-Semitism and so must embrace a notion of radical separation. On the other hand, David Nirenberg, for example, and perhaps most ordinary Jewish common sense understandings of the world, tend to see anti-Semitism as little more than ongoing repetition and to miss the significance of what is new about anti-Zionism. Acknowledging the novelty of anti-Zionism allows us to recognize a sense in which it reflects, albeit in distorted form, something important about the nature of the specific social and political relations of our time. This is of the time in which anti-Zionism is becoming a significant and possibly hegemonic phenomenon. I argue that Arendt's concept of, it's Arendt's concept of ideology that allows us to see the sense in which anti-Zionism offers a malevolent distortion of actually existing real world relations and conflict. Arendt understands ideology as a system of thought that believes it has found the key to history and as such reduces entire swathes of the human story, both past and present, along with their conflicts and complexities, contradictions and contingencies into a unidimensional predetermined theory. Arendt explains that this point by arguing that the logos, the ology of ideology, resides not in its purported subject matter or content, but rather in the belief that it is the idea itself that possesses it, its own logic and propels it forward. The point is therefore that ideology tells us nothing of the historical, social and political development that it pretends to capture in its presentation of the world, but rather that it is the idea that becomes the subject matter of science itself. For Arendt, therefore, the study of the ideology of anti-Zionism would be the study of an idea and the logic of its propulsion. As she said, ideological thinking orders facts into an absolutely logical procedure, which starts from an axiomatically accepted premise deducing everything else from it. That is, it proceeds with a consistency that exists nowhere in the realm of, the, of reality. For the Jewish question, whether in its iteration of the ideology of anti-Semitism or the ideology of anti-Zionism, its axiomatic accepted premise and its key to history is the harmfulness of Jews to the rest of humanity. However, we need to express some caution. Uh, Arendt's reference to facts, as if the ideology in question leaves the status of facts untouched. It would be more accurate to say that the ideology's specific, the ideology's specific content presents such facts 
in radical, malevolent, if not mythologized, distortions of actually existing social and political relations and the place of Jewish agency within them. Obviously, you know, you've got Jews have laser beams that can, you know, but nobody really falls for that. But facts manipulate, the facts of ideology are manipulated actuality. It is with these points in mind, therefore, that we can begin to see the offense that the ideology of anti-Zionism commits, not only against Jews, Zionists, and Israel, but, ex but against accepted reason-based and rational inter inter intellectual reflection and understandings of the world. To paraphrase Marx, uh, the ideology of anti-Zionism risks and at the time succeeds in turning history and politics into little more than superstition. And this is the nature of the of anti-Zionism defense against the internet. One of the most important sites for, for, for the ideology's offense against the intellect is ev evidenced by its offense against history. On the complex, uh, especially on the complex relationship between the Holocaust and the creation of Israel. It's here that the ideology's propensity to mythology can be clearly seen. Writing in, ex in an extended comment, tr comment troublingly troublingly titled on Israel's colonial occupation of Palestine, The Final Solution Without End, which written, uh, penned following the recent conflict between Israel and Hamas, the generally respected critical legal theorist, the Sousa Santos, wrote about the formation of the State of Israel. Forgive me, I'm going to read the quote. This is a well-known story. Let's leave the rhetoric rhetorical device alone now. This is a well-known story. Faced with the atrocities committed against Jews by the German Nazi regime during the Second World War, the West felt it was a moral obligation to accept the Zionist demand for the establishment of a Jewish state. Nothing one writes in defense of Palestinians will help alleviate the tribulations they have gone through since the creation of Israel, a suffering that is all the more unjust because it was inflicted to atone for the crimes committed by Europeans. This notion that Israel came into existence in 1948 as an act of atonement by the West for the Shoah, which uh, is referred to as atrocities committed against Jews during the Second World War, is now a theme often found in articulations of the ideology of anti-Zionism. For example, Enzo Traverso, in his recent The End of Jewish Modernity, states that the Jews aroused the sympathy of the European countries, guilty of having powerfully witnessed, if not collaborated in, the extermination of Jews by Nazism. This state of mind explains the British passivity during the conflict, four years after Zionist attacks against the Mandate Authority. The United Kingdom abstained in the UN partition vote, and its troops stood by and observed the massacres and expulsions of the Palestinians. So strong was this feeling of guilt and the need to atone by acceding to what anti-Zionist demands was that even Stalin's Soviet Union, who was busy locking, uh, locking up Jewish anti-fascists at the time, was moved to announce that the fact that no Western country had been able to ensure the basic rights of the Jewish people or protect them against the violence unleashed by the fascist executioners explains the aspiration of Jews to establish their own state. It would be unjust to deny them this right. Let me just pause here for a moment, because I don't have time to go through it all, to appreciate what is being said. That support for the nascent Jewish state was first universal among the numerous diverse countries who were said to constitute the West at the onset of the Cold War, not because of any considerations of real politic and national interest, um, but rather because of the need to atone for the guilt they felt over the genocide. So moved was the Soviets at the fight of the Jews and the sight that met them as they liberated Germany, that they felt it was their moral duty to lecture the West on its abandonment of the Jews. So strong was this moral imperative of guilt that the UK, the mandate power, remained passive 
both in relation to Zionist demands and the events that followed their leaving. A moment's reflection will show how anti-Zionism's presentation of this episode brings with it an offense against history, against politics, and against the intellect. When forced within the framework of its axiomatically accepted premise from which everything is deduced so that it proceeds with a consistency that exists nowhere in the realm of reality, we reach a situation where the alleged fact of universal Western guilt leading support for the creation of Israel is robbed from and elevated above the messy, contingent, conflictual world of diverse political interests and concerns. I need only mention a few. The, the rise of the Cold War. So what, what were these uh, real political issues and concerns? The rise of the Cold War, the decline of empires, the formation of new alliances, the politics of the Middle East, etc., and so forth. Actually, most of these played out in England um, uh, uh, under the, that first Labour government. It becomes genuinely believed as if the idea of guilt explained anything and everything. If you forgive the analogy, it is as if the ideology of anti-Semitism really does believe that the waters parted, giving the children of Israel an unobstructed path to the promised land, and this way superstition is substituted for history. Let me just clarify a point here. It is important to recognize that the specific content of an ideology, such as anti-Zionism, cannot exist with at least some connection with the actually existing world, no matter how much its incorporation suffers malevolent distortion. Without this tenuous connection, ideologies in general, and the ideologies of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in particular, would simply not have the power or traction to convince population after population of their claims to explain away, explain, explain away, the complexities of past and present and the uncertainties of the future, and to represent these complexities as little more than repetitious proof of their initial innate fit. So in the present discussion, I'm not saying that guilt played no role at all or did not enter in consideration. Jeffrey Herp has um, just written about this recently in relation to the states. What I'm saying is that when seen through the prism of the ideology of anti-Zionism, this reality, this fact, is manipulated and distorted so that a part becomes the whole, and as, ser and as such serves to erase every other aspect of the question. For example, those I've just alluded to, we are politics, politics of the time, etc. In other words, it is at least from the perspective of the ideology of anti-Zionism, as if the soul factor determining the birth of the state of Israel is that of Western guilt, a view that is ultimately intellectually and historically untenable. And it's here that we see the distortions and manipulation inherent in the forcing of the real world into the straitjacket of a domineering and dominating ideology. Just, just to finish off briefly in another couple of minutes if I may, um, continuity. The ideology of anti Zionism and the ideology of anti Semitism. I just want to make one further observation. As I noted above, a fertile ground of the ideology of anti Zionism is the connection it makes, or rather imagines, between the Holocaust and the creation of Israel. If the above discussion that I just uh, mentioned on guilt is a particular example, I want to show how it connects with and subsumes other pre-existing elements of the ideology of anti-Semitism, most notably of Holocaust denial. As we know, and I'll rush through this quickly, so bear with me. As we know, Holocaust denial, there's two parts to it. Deborah looks back, obviously, you know this. There's, it was a hoax, and it was a hoax committed because uh, the, the Jews wanted um, to, to make the world guilty, feel guilty, because of Israel, they blackmailed Israel. Uh, they, 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 the world, sorry, Israel, the Jews blackmailed the world. Now, no one believes it's a hoax anymore. So no one, you know, sensible believes. However, the, rate, the, the notion of guilt raised by both the Sousa Santos and Traverso echoes, no doubt unwittingly, the second element. 
Unfortunately, the idea that guilt played a part in the Jews' uh, Holocaust uh, guilt. This observation is not as far-fetched as it seems, and it, is, and it has indeed become part of the ideology of anti-Zionism. To finish off with a quote from Alan Beardieu, we can find the means in the Nazi gas chambers with which to confer on the colonial state of Israel some special status other than that all colonial states already have conferred on them for, for some decades. So that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks for listening.